Good morning, and uh, thank you for having me here this morning. You didn't really have a choice, so to those who did invite me here, thank you for having me here. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Di Beals, and my husband, Brandon, and I uh, pastor Canyon Creek Church just down the street in Mill Creek, but we spent seven of the best years of our life right here at Bethany Christian Assembly as youth pastors. Uh, we're grateful to Pastor Rob, who had a lot of grace for us when we didn't know what on earth we were doing. Um, but we knew how to love people, and we knew how to love Jesus, and that was modeled for us by the incredible staff here. So we're grateful. We would call this our church home, even though I, uh, both of us had been in churches before that. But this is truly our home. It was a formative time for us, and we are grateful. Uh, Brandon and I have three kids, our daughter, Rachel is 21. She's a senior in college at the University of Washington. She's a proud Husky fan, and uh, she was born while we were on staff here, so this is her home too. And then our boys are twins, and they are 16 years old, and they are juniors in high school at Glacier Peak. And uh, just have a, let's have a moment of silence for my car insurance amount, because <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> um, I could tell you lots of things about myself and hobbies and things like that, but I think the most important thing for you to know is I'm a lover of Jesus and I'm a lover of people. And if any of that could just ooze out of me and into you, I would gladly just impart that to you this morning. And so it's my privilege to share with you. Since you are uh, mostly kids pastors, kids volunteers, kids workers, I thought I would share a kid story that will be true to your heart uh, that should make you chuckle. In fact, I'll, I'll give two to you. One of them comes from my sister-in-law, who's uh, the preschool teacher uh, in our kids' ministry. And uh, this is her all-time favorite thing a kid has said in kids' ministry. And that is uh, she had been teaching the preschool class through the book of Genesis, or, you know, the high points of Genesis. And so as a point of review, she said, what have we learned so far about Genesis? What is Genesis 1-1? And one little boy raised his hand, ooh, ooh, ooh. And she said, yes, what, what's Genesis 1-1? And he said, in the beginning, God created Kevin and Earth. I don't know who Kevin is, but God made him. <laughs> can't make this stuff up. <laughs> that was a preschooler. Now let me tell you my favorite story from one of my children, and that is my son Judah. And my son Judah, I don't know if you know a kid like this or have a kid like this, but my son Judah is the kid that you'll be talking about something, and then 15 minutes later, he'll just randomly say a comment. But it's because he's been thinking about what you were talking about all that time, but you just don't know the process that went on underneath. And so when Judah was 11, Judah and Elijah, I had just gotten home from Israel. And so we were talk I was talking to my boys about Israel and about the Israelites and about the Ark of the Covenant, and it just so happened that we were preaching on the Ten Commandments. And so I was talking about the Ark of the Covenant and how, you know, what would be in the Ark of the Covenant. So I'm quizzing my boys, and so they're saying, well, the Ten Commandments would be in the Ark of the Covenant, and, oh, isn't there a staff in there? Like, yes, there's Aaron's staff, and then there's the jar of manna, and, and you know, and then we just went on in the conversation. Uh, and we were walking from our car to the church because we always end up with church buildings that don't have enough parking, <laughs> and so we have to walk a few blocks to church most of the time. And so we were walking up the street and chit-chatting about other things. By the time we got to the church building, Judah said, Mom, how'd they get all the guys in there? And remember, Judah's the one that's been, he's on a subject long, long ago. And so I have to be patient and stop and say, uh, what, are you, what are you talking about, Judah? Mom, how'd they get all the guys in there? The guys, how'd they get them in there? How'd they get them in where, Judah? I, I, help me know what you're talking about. You said the Ark of the Covenant had Aaron's staff in there. How'd he get all those guys in there? That's, that's a pastor's kid right there. <laughs> it's the only kind of staff he knows. <laughs> All right, true story. I want to start by telling you another story, and this is the story of a girl that I know, and she's given me permission to share her story with you. I think it is powerful. I think it illustrates well what I would like to leave with you today. And I'm really believing that God will speak to you this morning through her story. And so I'm just going to invite you to bow your heads with me as I open in prayer. God, I thank you that all across this room are people that you've, you've placed your finger on or your hand on, that you've stirred their heart, that you have called them and they have responded. And all throughout this room are people who have opportunities to touch people for you on a regular basis. 
And some in this room might be tired, some might feel discouraged, some might feel like they're not doing a good job, or they're failing you, or the church somehow, and some might be seeing great success, but are wondering what comes next, and everything in between. And so God, this morning I ask that you would, uh, beside me and in spite of me, that you would move through me and allow for something of encouragement to take root in the hearts of every person in this room. Use your word to speak life and that it would take root and it would bear fruit. In Jesus' name, amen. So this is the story of a girl that I know. She's grown now, uh, but when she uh, was born, it was to parents who were 15 and 16 years old. And so these parents were not planning to have a child, and in fact, they did not want a child, and in fact, they considered abortion, though they did not talk to her about that much throughout her lifetime, but it was sort of a known fact that that had been a consideration on the table. They decided to do the right thing. They decided to keep her. They decided to get married, and they got married just after she was born, and that was at the ages of 16 and 17. And they decided that they would raise her. They both dropped out of high school, and neither went back to high school. They both had to get jobs. In fact, her dad had to get a job and had never had a job before because he was a child. Uh, And then her mother stayed home to care for her. Neither of these parents knew any other way but to just do the best they could because neither had good role models from their own experiences growing up, and remember, they were still children anyway, and so there were problems, there was alcohol, there was other kinds of betrayal, Um, she doesn't know all the details, and she's glad not to, but she does know of some, and again, they were teenagers, just children themselves, and when this girl was five, she tells me that a neighbor, and she remembers this very clearly, a neighbor came to her house and asked her mom, if he could start taking her to church, in fact, it was to Sunday school, with his own children. And she says that she loved school, and so she remembers hearing the word Sunday school and just thinking it was an extra day of school in the week because she had just started kindergarten. And so when asked if she would like to go to Sunday school, she remembers being excited and saying yes. She remembers riding to church with this family. She remembers this man still to this day. She remembers those kids. She remembers what the church looks like inside. She remembers the classroom that she would go to. And she remembers the day at the age of six that a kids worker asked her if she would like to ask Jesus into her heart and give her life to Jesus. And I'm going to come back to this story in just a little bit. But I wanted to take just a minute to point out two quick things that really impressed me about the adults in this story. Because according to my friend, these two adults made pivotal impacts in her life. And so here's the two things that stood out to me. Number one, these two adults, they understood that these children had value and that they were worth seeking out. Okay, so these these adults, this would be the neighbor that offered to take the kid to church, and this would be the, uh, the key volunteer, the, the kids ministry volunteer that asked this girl if she wanted to ask Jesus into her heart. So these adults understood these, these kids have value. They're worth going out of my way for and they're worth seeking out. And the second thing that really impressed me is that um, these adults understood that these kids could make a decision, even at a young age, that would alter the entire course of their life for all of eternity. I want to look at God's Word this morning, and uh, if you have your Bible, I'd love for you to turn to Luke chapter 15. This is where we'll spend some of our time, and I I want you to hear me say as you're turning there, and if you don't have your Bible, the words will be on the screen, but first of all, people, or in this case, children, because that's what this conference is for, those of you that are working with children, children are worth seeking out and searching for. They are of value. Kids 
by your influence can have the entire course of their life changed for all of eternity. And as you all know, kids' ministry is anything but babysitting. <laughs> In fact, it's insulting to most kids' workers or kids' pastors to be called child care on a Sunday morning. And it is not it's anything but child care. In fact, Jesus said that all the little children should be allowed to come to him, and he warned woes on anyone who harmed or stood in the way of a child. And so the theme of Luke chapter 15, and, and you might not know this, but the whole theme of the book, or the chapter, is that what is being searched for has value. And this is what I want you to really, I want it to resonate inside of you. That, that these children, or in the case of scripture, there's these parables that what is being searched for is valuable. So Luke chapter 15 kind of sets it up for us. The first couple of uh, verses just talk about how these sinners, tax collectors and sinners, kept hanging out with Jesus to hear him teach. And this, of course, made the teachers of the law quite irritated. And so they were always looking for ways to trip Jesus up or to, uh, to catch him in doing something wrong. And so if we start in uh, verse 3, we'll see how Jesus responds to this scenario. So this first little chunk of scripture is probably very familiar to you, and this is the parable of the lost sheep. So scripture, and this is Jesus, tells them a story says, if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go to search for the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. And when he arrives, he will call together his friends and his neighbors saying, rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. Now, I've had the privilege of being to Israel. In fact, I've been there four times. And four times uh, I've gone to Bethlehem, and Bethlehem has an area that still has the fields that they strongly believe shepherds would have brought their flocks to, and those fields are full of caves, and it's actually really cool because you can walk through them. And these caves are, are huge cavernous things down underneath the ground, so there's a small opening, and then you, you go down through this little tunnel, and then you're in this giant cave underneath the ground. And so many believe that this would be where shepherds would take their flocks at night in order to protect them. As you know, there were certain things that shepherds had to protect their sheep from. Being lost was one, uh, but predators was another. And so uh, any kind of predatory animal that might harm the sheep, they had to protect them from. And so there's ways that you can do that. One of the easiest was to put them in a confined space. And so there's all kinds of teachings, and I know you've heard them about sheep and how they know the voice of the shepherd, and they follow the shepherd, and all those things are true. But what I want you to hear this morning is that sometimes ministers can become confused. And sometimes ministers put their personal goals ahead of the needs of the sheep. But what Jesus does is he lays out for us the importance of putting the needs of the sheep, and if you follow the parable, this is, this is God's people. These are his, his precious, precious children, uh, that we are to put the needs of them first. In fact, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. Um, if you have your Bible and you want to turn quickly over to John chapter 10, this is where he actually says this. Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd, and the good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. A hired hand will run when he sees a wolf coming. He'll abandon the sheep because they don't actually belong to him, and he isn't their shepherd. In other words, there's no ownership there. And so the wolf attacks them and scatters the flock. The hired hand runs away. Why? Because he's working only for the money, and he doesn't care about the sheep. See, sometimes ministers can become confused. And if you're in this room and you work with children, you're a minister. And so, and if you work with adults, you're a minister. And so, as we work with people, as we minister to them, we have a responsibility to care for them in the manner of a shepherd, not in the manner of a hired hand. A hired hand cares about the position, cares about the title that comes with it, cares about the money even, and let's all laugh for a minute because you're not doing this for the money. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> in fact, how many of you in this room don't get paid a single cent to love a kid? I mean, it's half the room. Okay, so... But we can get caught up in, uh, in losing track of the importance of protecting and caring for what God would want us to protect and care for. And so when we read a scripture like that, we can see that the hired hand has um, potential to really mess this up. And, and I'll speak for myself. As a minister, as a, as a pastor on staff at a church, 
I don't ever want it to be about the money. I don't ever want it to be about the position. I don't ever want it to be about the platform. Um, I even hesitate often to take opportunities to come and speak because I, I don't, it's not about advancing me. I want to advance the gospel. I want to do my very best to love Jesus and to love the people he's brought to us and to win my neighbors and to win those he's put me in influence with. And the cost for that is often great. And we have to accept the cost. There is a cost to us. Um, 1 Peter 5.2 says, Care for the flock that God has entrusted to you. Watch over it willingly, not grudgingly, not for what you will get out of it, but because you are eager to serve God, not because you're a hired hand. Lead them by your own good example, and when the great shepherd appears, you will receive a crown of never-ending glory and honor. Be the shepherds of the flock that God has given you, however small, however big, however small, however big. Be shepherds of that flock of the children of God who are precious to him and who are like treasure because you're willing to do it and because you're eager to serve, not because of position or rank or opportunity or anything else, but because it's a privilege and because they're God's sheep and because they are his treasure. And as shepherds of his treasure, we stand between the sheep and that which would attack. We stand between the children and the predators of the children. And the predators come in all shapes and sizes these days. But it's our job to guard and protect and to teach. And shepherding is hard. In fact, shepherding can be lonely work. If you know anything about shepherding culture, especially in the Middle East, shepherds were the lowliest. Okay, they are the ones that are looked down upon. They smell. They have the lowest level of a job. They don't have any uh, prestige in society at all. You would never choose for your child, your daughter, I want you to marry a shepherd. And yet they have this job of immense importance, especially if you look at the parallel for us today. Um, maybe you've seen the image, uh, the beautiful painting of the non-Middle Eastern-looking Jesus with his flowing hair and the, and the little sheep or the lamb around his neck. Have you seen a picture like that before? Um, when I was in Israel, um, our Arab guide, who, a Christian Arab man, uh, has shepherds in his family lineage. And so he was explaining for us the importance and the duties of shepherds. And so we were sitting in a chapel that's built in the fields where all these shepherds' caves are. And he sat us down, and he had us look at that painting on the wall, a very familiar painting of Jesus with the sheep around his neck. And with tears in his eyes, and I wish I could recreate the passion he tells this story with, but it was very moving to me to understand this. Um, as you probably know, sheep can be quite dumb. <laughs> in fact, we like to say in church world, the shepherd carries a staff because the sheep bite. <laughs> but the sheep can be very uh, unintelligent, we'll say it nicely. And so sheep tend to wander. And sheep get distracted. And sheep wander off on their own, and they, they don't obey the shepherd. And sometimes some sheep are particularly prone to wandering. And so the shepherd does his job to encourage that sheep back into the fold. In fact, as we read earlier, he'll leave the 99 sometimes to go and look for the one. Now, if you were to just look at that in, in um, just intelligent terms, it would not be intelligent for the shepherd to leave 99 to go get the one unless you had someone to watch over the 99 to go and find the one. This is supposed to represent the extreme love of Jesus, that he would leave the 99 because that one is so important. But in the case of the shepherd leaving to go find the one, if that one has, is a repeat offender, if that little sheep has continued to wander off, the shepherd will break his leg. And he will break his leg, and then he will put the sheep around his shoulders, and so we see this beautiful picture of this, oh, he went and found the sheep, and then he carried it lovingly back. No, he has to discipline the sheep. And so he puts the sheep around his shoulders, and then he has to feed it because it can't walk, and it can't go get food on its own. But while he's nursing and nurturing it back to health, that sheep creates a bond with the shepherd, and it will never leave the side of the shepherd ever again. And that is the beauty of searching for what is lost and bringing it back to relationship 
with the shepherd. And so everything, every child that we are searching for, every child is a treasure to God, and those sheep, those treasures are valuable. There's another example just in the couple scriptures to follow, and this is the parable of the lost coin. So just to reinforce it, or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and she loses one. Won't she light a lamp and sweep the entire house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she will call all her friends and neighbors and she'll say, rejoice with me because I found my lost coin in the same way. That's the rejoicing that happens in heaven when just one sheep, just one child, just one soul returns to Christ. That's the beauty of the importance and the value of what we are seeking for. This woman sought out one coin and she was willing to turn everything upside down to find it. And that's the theme that should reside in our heart is that we would be willing to go to any length to find that one precious soul and bring it back to Christ. And then the next passage is the very familiar passage, the parable of the lost son. And that begins in verse 11. I won't read the whole story, but just so that we're on the same page, I will summarize it for you, because you're probably quite familiar. But we have a young man who approaches his father and says, I want my inheritance. I want to go spend it. And he does. He goes and he lives wildly. He travels a distance away. Uh, His father does not know where he is. He has not seen him. And this young man uh, squanders all of it. Verse 17 says he finally comes to his senses in a pig pen, watching the pigs eat better food than he has because he's starving. And in the filth of his own sin and his own decisions, he makes a decision to go home, thinking maybe my father will at least hire me to be a hired hand on Uh, on his property. And Luke 15, 20, of course, tells us that when his father saw him coming, while he was still a long way off, he was filled with compassion for him, and he ran to his son, and he threw his arms around him, and he kissed him. Now, this young man probably smelled bad. He probably looked in a horrible condition, but there was not judgment from his father, because if you, if you picture the father like Jesus, who is the good shepherd, you see the love and the acceptance and the importance of what is most valuable to him. His own precious son has been returned to him. He's not a disappointment. He's not a failure. He's not worthless. He's not broken beyond repair. He hasn't sinned too much. He hasn't been damaged too greatly. Instead, he is his most precious prized possession returned to him. And before you can speak into any child, can I just speak into you for a moment? You are that most prized possession. We're talking about kids, but can we just talk about you for a second? You, who probably don't get to go to service very often or at all, probably haven't heard an encouraging message in a long time. Maybe you haven't gotten to be a a part of encouraging worship that just kind of fills you and makes you feel alive for a really long time. You don't always get to be a part of the joke that happened during service or the response of people to the Lord. You don't always get to see that, but you are his treasure, and that matters first. So as I look you in the eye, I want to tell you that you are valuable and you are precious and you are sought out and your relationship with Jesus, the good shepherd, comes first. It comes first that he finds you and seeks you out, that he's put his finger on you and he's called you, he's even called you this weekend to be here to receive and to be uh, poured into because his finger is on you because you matter to him. And it's from that relationship with Jesus, it's from the desire to know him and to know him intimately and to be known by him. In fact, Paul says, I want to know Christ. And when he says, I want to know Christ, that's not a head knowledge. That's a depth of worship and love and intimacy. I want to know Christ. And then he compares that to being worthless. Everything else is worthless compared to knowing Christ like that. Everything else is dung. It's sediment that falls to the bottom of a vat of wine when you're fermenting it. It's like feces. It's like broken pottery in a field. Everything else is worthless compared to knowing Jesus. That's my reminder for you this morning, that you are worth him seeking out, and he is worth your attention and your affection and your love and your pursuit, regardless if that happens on a Sunday morning in the big service or not. You matter first. And out of that overflow of love and relationship with Christ comes what you have to spill over into his precious treasure, which is his children. That's what he's called you to do, but it's never about what he's called you to do. 
It's about who he's called you to be. And he's called you to be one of his sheep and to stay close to him and to pursue him and to know his voice. And that when he calls, you respond. He's called you also to be a shepherd. And as you act as a shepherd, it comes from that relationship with him. And as you perform those things, they are what not, that, that's not what matters. That's what comes out of your relationship with Christ. So by definition, treasure is a concentration of riches often considered lost or forgotten until discovered. And before I go any further, if, you, if you've walked away in your heart or you're distant from the Lord or you've just gotten busy or your priorities are just kind of out of whack, if you were honest, before we go any further, I want you to hear me say if you're, if you're missing your relationship with your father, if that is not first, if your relationship with the shepherd is not close, first, you have to be like the prodigal son. You have to come to your senses, and you have to say, this is not where I should be. I should be with my father. And you have to turn and make a decision to walk the road back to him. Quick side note, I knew a young lady um, when we lived in California, um, and her name is Chrissy, and Chrissy had a severe eating disorder. Um, she was severely anorexic. As a teenager, as a gymnast, as a very pretty muscular girl, her anorexia stole everything from her. And when she was just over 50 pounds, she was admitted to an eating disorder unit. And I don't even know if you know those exist. I didn't know they existed at the time. But she was put in the eating disorder unit in, in, the, in that hallway where all the anorexic young ladies go, and it, it was a women's wing, and uh, she, back, back in these days, we didn't have cell phones, and so she would write letters to me, and she wrote me a letter from the eating disorder unit, and it, she wrote one phrase that messed me up for all of the days of my life. She said, Di, I see these young girls come in here, and I can see that they are unhealthy. I can see that they're sick. I can see that their hair is falling out and their skin is gray. I can see that their bones are protruding in ways they shouldn't protrude, but I don't see myself that way. When I look in the mirror, I see ugly, I see fat, I see broken, I see something that's not repairable. And this is the phrase that messed me up for all of eternity. She said, I wish for just one minute I could see myself the way that God sees me. And that phrase has haunted me for all of my days since then. And so if you're in this place and you feel ashamed like she did or ugly or broken or like a failure or a disappointment, can I remind you for a minute how God sees you? You don't have a choice. I'm going to do it anyway. This is how God sees you. I'm going to whip through some scripture, and if you want to write these down and look them up later, I'm going to blaze through them. But I want you to hear how God sees you this morning. And of course, this is how he sees his children, the children you're ministering to. But I want you to receive this for yourself first. Would you put a hand over your heart right now? And would you just say, God, let me receive this. Let me see myself the way you see me. Deuteronomy 7, 6, for you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all people of the face of the earth to be his most treasured possession. Isaiah 43, 1, I have redeemed you and I have summoned you by your own name because you belong to me. Psalm 139, 14, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Psalm 17, Deuteronomy 32, Zechariah 2, they all say you are the apple of his eye. And that word apple means his most favorite, his prized possession, most important to him, more important than anybody else. You are the apple of his eye. Deuteronomy 32 also says, you are the Lord's portion and his inheritance. First Peter 2 9 says, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people who belong to God. And Deuteronomy 10:15. The Lord has set his affection on you. The Lord has set his affection on you. He loves you and he chose you. You're his treasure first. 
He knows you. He pursues you. He loves you. He's coming after you. He's calling you. He desires you. He wants you in relationship with him because you are precious to him. And from that personal knowledge, from that intimacy, from that desire to know him in return, from that desire to be like the sheep that stays right next to the shepherd, from that comes what you have to give to anybody else. And so back to the story of the little girl that I started with. The girl that is now an adult that gave me permission to tell her story. And the reason I tell her story is because what you do, it matters. It matters. Every kid you love, it matters. Every kid you encourage, it matters. Every kid you want to strangle and don't, it matters. And so this girl told me that she remembers being that little girl asked by a kids worker, do you want to ask Jesus into your life? And at six years old, she remembers saying, yes, I want to give my life to Jesus. And at six years old, she, sa- she tells me, I remember this so clearly. She says, I-, I remember the woman who prayed this prayer with me. I still have the piece of paper where we wrote down the prayer of asking Jesus into my heart. So she said yes. After another week or two, the girl's mom, who felt incredibly guilty that her daughter would walk out to the end of the driveway, get in the car with the neighbor, and go to church, and her mom had no clue where she went every week. Her mom got in the car, and at a safe distance, followed the neighbors to church to see where her daughter was going. And it was that Sunday that that mom sat in a church service, and she gave her life to Jesus, too. And she had a little baby, and he was raised knowing Jesus, And from then on, that girl and her little brother and her mom, they went faithfully to church. They moved somewhere, you know, in the next year or two. And so they found another church that was close to their home to be a part of. And that girl grew up in church, and she learned about Jesus, and she learned about the Bible. And she, as she tells it, when she got to high school, she chose Jesus over drugs and over alcohol and over the sexual activity that her friends chose. And when she was in college... She said yes to Jesus when he directed her to go where he wanted her to go, which at that particular time was to go on a mission trip. And so she went on a mission trip, and as she tells the story, that was a pivotal moment in her life because it was on that mission trip that she led the first person she had ever led to Jesus, which was a 12-year-old girl. And she wept with a 12-year-old girl when that little girl asked Jesus into her life because she remembered being a 6-year-old girl inviting Jesus into her life. And for the next few weeks of that missions trip, she led dozens of people to the Lord, adults and children. And she went home and she decided, what what am I going to do with my life? I just want to lead people to Jesus. And someone told her that's called being a pastor. (laughs) And so she became a pastor. And she's been a pastor for 27 years. And she's had the privilege of leading many people to the Lord. And she and her husband do ministry together. And they have three kids who also love the Lord. And she gets the opportunity to travel and to speak and encourage people to know the Lord and surrender their life to him. And you probably guess that little girl is me. That at five years old, just a neighbor guy said that little kid is valuable. And I don't know where she'll go in her life, but I see the family she's in. And maybe he didn't even know what my family was like. But my family was a mess. My parents didn't have an example. They'd never been in church before. They didn't know how to raise kids to know the Lord. But that man saw value in that little girl, me. And I don't know where he is today. I remember his first name, and that's all. But I wish he could know that that important step out made a difference for all of eternity in one girl's life, but also in her children's life and in the people that I have the opportunity to pray with and lead to the Lord. So can I tell you today that what you do, it matters. That every kid that is frustrating or seems like they're not paying attention or maybe seems like they're not worth it, they're all worth it, every one of them, because you have no idea, first of all, the love that God has for every one of those kids, but you also have no idea how you can affect their life for all of eternity and the lives of many to come. There are generations to come that will carry the name Beals 
and how God has allowed me to influence my children and how they will influence theirs all goes back to that one man who took me to church and that one woman who said, do you want to ask Jesus in your life? She wasn't a kids pastor, just a volunteer, just somebody who just worked in kids ministry faithfully. It made all the difference. What you do, it matters. If you haven't been told that lately, thank you for what you do. It matters. You are making a difference. You may never know it this side of heaven, but someday you may stand in heaven before the Lord who you were made to worship. And in that worship, you might have the opportunity to see all of the children that you were able to impact for eternity, and it makes all the difference in the world. So press into Jesus and be encouraged because what you're doing, it matters. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me because I want to pray two prayers with you. The first one is, and this is a real honest moment, so nobody's looking. You're not raising your hand for me in a moment. You're raising your hand because this is, this is between you and the Lord. But if you are somebody that has lost your first love, maybe you've just gotten caught up in the motions of ministry, You've gotten caught up in the, the doing and not the being, the being a child of God, being one of his sheep that stays close to him. And you just, by a show of a hand, I'm going to pray for you. You just need to say, I got to get this straightened out. I got I to gotta get the priorities back in the right order. I got to put Jesus first. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? Thank you. Yeah, lots of you. I'm going to pray for you first. Would you just agree with me? In fact, would everyone in this room, again, just put a hand over your heart or both hands over your heart. Nothing magical about this. It's just symbolic of saying, Jesus, get in here. Really seep in here. So, Jesus, we come before you this morning. You are the good shepherd. You are the one that we are made to know and be known by and to love and to pursue. You are first. All the stuff we do is completely irrelevant compared to knowing you. All of the things we do flow out of who we are, and we belong to you. So I pray just draw close the hearts of every person in this room, especially those who raise their hand, those who are working and, and, and faithfully serving, but have maybe just put things in the wrong order. We confess that we need you first. And so we, with repentant hearts, say, Jesus, we need you. We need you to forgive us. We need you to relight the flame that's in our heart. And it's our responsibility to fan it into flame and to keep it burning. So God, would you just draw close every person in this room? Amen. With your head still bowed, um, I would also love to pray for you for opportunities for you to impact kids for all of eternity. And I don't have to ask you to raise your hand because I don't think you'd be here if you didn't desire that. You wouldn't be here looking for ways to grow and be more effective. And so um, I'm going to just ask you to stand with me. And I want to close in prayer that God would give us God-ordained opportunities and bring us his kids. So would you agree with me? God, you are sovereign over all. You are the architect of everything. You are all power and all knowing and also all loving and all seeing. And you see every kid. uh, You see the ones that have incredible families that are nurturing them and raising them to know you. And you see the ones that are maybe even forgotten or just struggling to kind of make it on their own with families that aren't supportive and don't know you. And all the ones in between. And so, God, we stand before you, even those of us who don't directly work in kids' ministry, but every parent in this room, every grandparent in this room, every kids' worker, every kids' pastor, every volunteer, everyone who holds a baby or works with toddlers, preschoolers, in in our elementary age kids, on up into youth ministry. God, we ask you that you would give us open doors and open opportunities, that you would sovereignly help us to see that kid that's struggling, to see the one that needs encouragement, to see the one that needs love, to see the one that needs an extra minute. God, would we be conduits of your love and your acceptance? The fact that you see those kids as treasure, help us to just pass that on to them. Help us to see the kids the way that you see them, that they are valuable to you, that you seek them out, that what you're seeking for is beyond uh, any value earthly wise. And so we pray, God, that you would help us to see kids 
with your love and that you would rejuvenate and re-energize. You would help us to be back uh, on mission with a vision, understanding that what you've called us to do is tiring. It's sometimes lonely. It's always hard work, but it can have eternal significance beyond what we could even understand. So give us open doors and open opportunities, and we will be faithful to walk through them knowing that you are moving, and we thank you for the opportunity to work for you. In Jesus' name, amen.